from Korea to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant James Mansfield. Recently, the Army authorized another battle star for the Korean War, the third winter campaign. What was this winter like in Korea? What is the soldier going through in order to earn this new battle star? Today, we'd like to take you to Korea and relive for you some of the hardships and the fighting these men have endured. This is the front line in Korea. These mountains are the backdrop for the fighting here. They're swarming with Chinese and North Korean troops. They make a beautiful picture from a distance. In the shadow of these impressive mountains stretching along the entire length of the front, are the hills, the bitterly contested hills you read about in the newspapers. These are the strategic positions we must occupy or keep the communists from occupying if we're to hold them and block any large-scale drive to the south. They're desolate hills. Their slopes are scarred and pitted from constant shelling. Every sign of vegetation has been obliterated. This is where our frontline troops live and work. They move about with extreme caution during the day. They're under constant observation by the enemy and within range of his guns. These key hills are precarious positions. The communists want us off of them. Attacks are inevitable and frequent. To hold these positions, our men are forced to dig in, building deep trenches so they can move around unobserved and barricading themselves in underground bunkers to escape the long nightly shellings. During the long wait between attacks, they burrow deeper into the ground, living almost like animals, coming out only to supply themselves with food or charcoal to warm themselves. They use charcoal because it doesn't smoke. That's important when you're living in a poorly ventilated bunker. On the protected southern slopes of these hills, life's a little more normal. They're still within calling distance of the enemy, but here at least they can walk around without worrying about snipers. Here, some of them even have a chance to forget the war and the conditions they live under. Well, for a few minutes, anyway. The chickens were the Sarge's idea. He picked them up back in Seoul. It was supposed to be a gag on the old man, because he was always complaining about eating powdered eggs. The sergeant wasn't thinking of keeping them. That was our idea. We even gave them names. The rooster is Big White Feather. We call that speckled hen, Margaret. We feed them the same things we get, mostly sea rations. And they love it. Nobody can figure it out. They seem to thrive on it. Sure took a lot of scrounging to come up with enough chicken wire to build that coop. A couple of the guys even pitched in and built them a bunker. They need one here. You know, it's funny about those chickens. 
They've been under fire almost every night, and it doesn't seem to bother them a bit. Maybe that's why we like to have them around. If they can take it, we ought to be able to. Whatever reason we have for keeping those chicks, it's certainly not the eggs. We only get two or three a day, and they wouldn't go far with a couple of hundred guys. The way it works out, the one that happens to be taking care of them usually gets the eggs. He's welcome to them. Our cooking facilities on the hill aren't so good. We usually let the chickens run around loose during the day. Everybody gets a kick out of seeing and hearing them. We lock them up at night before the commie shells begin coming in. We've been lucky so far. We haven't lost a one. Those chicks have seen a lot more than 30 days of frontline service. They've really earned that combat infantry badge. And while these men are caring for their chickens, a few hundred yards away, other UN troops are studying the enemy positions and trying to figure out what he is up to. That's what the war in Korea is like. It's a war of waiting and watching. The patrolling goes on constantly, probing and testing the enemy, harassing his weaker positions. There's sporadic fighting, but it's mostly skirmishing or jockeying for position.